Continuamos con la siguiente ponencia. Eh, os tengo que presentar a dos personas que vienen en representación de la European Social Network. Es una eh, red europea en la que se concentran sobre todo eh, asociaciones de directores de servicios sociales de distintos países europeos. Ellos eh, el, hacen grupos de trabajo y elaboran documentos de re recomendaciones eh, sobre temas específicos relacionados con los servicios sociales y en 2012 se creó un grupo eh, de trabajo sobre liderazgo, innovación eh, y, y eficiencia en servicios sociales. Eh, es por eso que nosotros les hemos invitado a participar en, en estas jornadas porque creemos que nos pueden ofrecer una visión un poco general de lo que está sucediendo en Europa en términos de innovación y gestión de la, de la crisis. Eh, Stephen nos ofrecerá en este sentido una visión un poco más general y después eh, eh, Steiner Egen Christensen, perdón si no lo digo bien, que es director de los servicios sociales de la ciudad de Arus en Dinamarca, nos presentará eh, cómo eh, se ha llevado a cabo una estrategia de, de contención del coste de los servicios sociales en esa ciudad. Una experiencia práctica, por tanto. Les cedo la palabra. Um, thank you very much, Madeline, and um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hola a todas uh, y a todos. Um, yo hablo un poco español, pero no tan bien para uh, dar esta presentación en español, lo siento. Uh, entonces, continúo en inglés. Um, Well, we're, we're delighted to be here at this uh, international seminar on social services crisis and um, solutions. As Madeline said, I'm going to offer a slightly more general overview of what's happening in Europe in terms of the crisis, its impact on social services and how social services are responding to the crisis. And then Steiner will take over and offer you a uh, case study um, from uh, the city of Aarhus in Denmark. Um, but I wanted to say at the beginning that uh, in these times of crisis, it's all the more important, I think, that we in Europe have these sorts of opportunities to meet with each, o with each other, um, to exchange our ideas, because we are facing very similar um, challenges in all of our countries. And we have noticed in ESN that there is even more uh, demand now, despite the uh, crisis, despite the pressure on budgets, for uh, knowledge about what is happening in other European countries. So um, I'm going to uh, start then with a, a general um, overview of what's happening for in this area um, in, uh, in the rest of Europe. And on the basis of some pretty difficult questions that I was sent by the, uh, by the colleagues in the CIS, and I'm so relieved that this is not an academic exam and that I'm going to be not going to be marked on these, on these very difficult questions. But they are pretty good questions for, for that. Um, I'm not going to uh, attempt to answer them systematically one by one, but they essentially concern the impact of the crisis and responses to it. So I'm just going to cover those, those two things in, in, a, in a general way. But um, first, I thought I should start with a, an easier um, question, which is to explain what is the, the European social network. Um, Madeleine explained it a little bit already uh, in Spanish, and she knows it because um, the CIS is a member of the European social network. But we are essentially a, a membership organization for um, directors and senior managers in social services in local and regional <coughs> government. Members are associations of social directors, um, which exist in, uh, in some of the countries, but also individual uh, local and regional um, authorities. And in fact, regions have a, a particularly important, have a growing uh, role in this area, and they have a, they're an important part of our, of our membership, and they have a, there's an increasing recognition of the role of regions at the European level, um, too. So, um, maybe in order to help you understand a bit more uh, the sort of organizations that are 
um, involved in ESN. These are the members in the um, Basque Country and in the rest of Spain. Um, you can see that as well as one of the departments of the Basque government, we also have uh, members from uh, other um, regions in Spain, Catalonia, Galicia, Ana Lucia, and Castilla-La Mancha. Um, and what we, what we do is we organize different types of events. Um, we have organized um, events that are quite similar to, um, to this one. Um, but with participation from, um, from, a, from a wide variety of different countries. And in fact, last week, um, as an example, I was at a, a seminar that we organized in Germany on independence and inclusion in um, later life. Uh, that, that was in the context of uh, the European year of active aging and solidarity between the generations. And our next couple of events are more uh, general about the design and the ethos of social services in the coming years. Um, the, uh, Caroline already mentioned choice and control for service users and we're going to be asking at a seminar next spring just how much choice and control is it possible to um, give to um, service users. And then we have a, a major conference with the, under the Irish presidency of the European Union next June in uh, Dublin, which is looking at how services can help to transform um, people's lives. There's perhaps a tendency at the moment with the crisis to look very, um, in a very focused way at the, at the structure of social services and at our budgets, but I think we need to keep the focus on what difference we're actually making to the lives of the people who use um, our services. And um, this is a, a photograph of one of our uh, working groups, um, of which Steinar is a member. And it's been the main uh, way that we have monitored the impact of the crisis and the responses to it. And we brought together a, uh, a group of um, senior managers in social services from a, from a wide range of um, different countries, and you'll see some of the material that I have in this presentation comes from that, comes from that group. Well, um, so much for the easy question. Uh, now on to the more difficult questions, um, the effects of the crisis. I think the first thing to say is that social services are affected um, by the crisis because the people that we um, serve are affected by it. Um, and I don't mean only those that were already receiving uh, social work or social care service before the crisis, but there are also uh, now new um, groups that are receiving benefits and help from social services. And this uh, quite complicated looking graph shows the change in the long-term unemployment rate um, in Europe uh, over the last three years. And you can see just a, a few observations. You can see that the biggest impact in the long-term unemployment rate was always in 2009, um, at the beginning of the crisis, and that it was, there was a greater impact on, in terms of age groups on younger people, and in terms of gender, greater impact on women, and also a greater impact on people from outside of the European Union living uh, in Europe than there were on the nationals of the EU member states. And education on the far um, right is also a, uh, a big determinant of whether you are in long-term unemployment. However, there's only um, the European figures that are, uh, the statistics that exist are quite general. They have uh, less to do with the more complex um, social work and care services. Um, that, uh, that, are, that, that we are interested in here. So there's a, a few points here from a group of independent experts on social inclusion, which are funded um, by the European Commission. And they point to uh, other social problems around debt, um, which has uh, risen probably as a result of unemployment as well. Housing costs are, a, are a major, uh, having a major impact on people's um, uh, on how much money they have. And there's also an increased risk of severe poverty for people from certain backgrounds, migrants, um, people from a Roma background, and the uh, homeless. 
population. Um, however, I don't think that these, this is the time for defeatism where we see all these graphs where everything is just getting worse. Um, in fact, social protection, the European social model, is still making quite a big difference to people's lives. Now, these are, again, very general European statistics, but they're interesting because you can see that um, from 2008 to 2010, there was an 0.7 percentage point rise in the uh, risk of um, poverty in the EU without taking into account social transfers, i.e. cash benefits. But if you take into account the cash benefits that are given out, then um, you can see that the uh, at risk of poverty rate has essentially stayed the same for the EU27 as a whole. Um, I also put the figures up there for the euro area and for Spain, and you can see that um, social protection there has limited the increase in the um, um, risk of poverty rate, though it hasn't kept it um, stable as for the average, for the European average. This at risk of poverty rate, by the way, is uh, the, the measure that is used by the European Union is um, the number of people living in households with an income below 60% of the average. That's what is meant here by at risk of poverty. So um, that was uh, about the, um, the social impact of the crisis. Uh, and now on to how it's affected um, budgets for social services. I have some statistics here from uh, Dexia Bank, um, which has felt the impact of the crisis itself, and from the, European, um, uh, the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. And they compile data on subnational spending on uh, social services and on other areas. And they show that spending on social services went up by 9% um, in 2009 as a whole. So, um, but then they say because unemployment fell uh, more into 2011, the growth in social spending at subnational level was a little bit smaller. Now, this isn't only to do with um, the crisis. Uh, I've I've heard that here in the Basque Country you've had a new act on social services and also at the Spanish national level there's the dependency law. So there are also virtually constant uh, legislative reforms going on in countries. And one of um, the trends is to actually give municipalities uh, more responsibility, more competences for social spending and that's partly responsible for um, these rises in the EU average. Um, I wanted to share you with, with you a, a theory that, is, um, that one can draw from, from these statistics and from, um, from what I've heard from ESN members, which is that these increases in, spending, in social spending have a lot to do with the increase in uh, receipt of benefits due to unemployment and the associated rise in entitlement to housing benefit, um, other forms of health benefit, benefit for children, and so on. So perhaps spending on benefits is rising, but uh, I would posit that investment in services is decreasing or is staying the same. And that might mean that we are responding still in Europe to people's immediate material needs, particularly those that have been worst affected by the crisis, but perhaps we're not doing such a good job at helping them to uh, manage or overcome their problems and that would include those who are, were already receiving uh, social work or care service b before the crisis hit. So that's a little theory and uh, it would be interesting to hear your reactions to it. Um, however, this I've only shown you the global European statistics um, so far, but of course there are huge differences between the member states um, and also within them. Um, and there's no real logical um, grouping of countries in this graph which shows the percentage increase in subnational spending on social services in 2011 compared with 2010. You've got Romania and Latvia who had um, some pretty dramatic decreases uh, in social spending. I think that has to do a lot with um, reduction in um, staff costs, reduced uh, salaries. 
but at the top of the graph, uh, you have Portugal, which has seen some, uh, also some dramatic effects of the crisis. And what we're seeing in Portugal is that municipalities are, uh, citizens expect help, they expect emergency social aid uh, from the state. And because the municipalities are the level that's closest to the citizens, it's, uh, they get the requests for help, they get the demand for help, and that Portuguese municipalities have responded um, to citizens' expectation, and therefore their spending, which was very low on social services and social benefits before the crisis, has actually risen slightly. So what are um, social services, uh, how are social services in local and regional governments um, responding uh, to the crisis, what are they doing? Well, there are some short-term uh, immediate cost-saving measures that can be used, and they have a lot to do with um, staff costs, which make up something like 80% of the budget in the area of social services. That's services rather than benefits. Um, so three of these points have to do with uh, staff, um, freezing recruitment, um, making some staff redundant, i.e. they lose their jobs, or um, uh, introducing pay cuts for, for staff in social services. Users, um, particularly older people, are also being asked to pay more for, um, service, for social care uh, services. And the middle point is about um, outsourcing, contracting out uh, services previously provided by municipalities or provinces or regions themselves to external providers. Um, and this point says that uh, there is more uh, outsourcing now, but we've also heard um, that there is actually more, uh, there's also some insourcing going on. So some municipalities are taking their services back in-house because they want to get a better control of the um, budget, of the spending, and they can do it better when it's um, when they're managing the services directly. Um, however, besides these uh, short-term um, cost-saving measures, there are also some strategic choices that can be made in social services. And a lot of them, again, have to do with uh, the staff. They have to do with um, looking after and investing in the staff's skills. They're also under some strain. They may have had pay cuts. They may have... Uh, uh, there, may, there may be an increasing caseload for staff, so I think we do have to um, take good, good care of them as well. Um, we also have to look out for um, team managers at the, at the local level um, because they're the ones that are controlling the, the flow of casework and how much time is spent with each person. Um, and if we can... Uh, we don't just need in the social services sector people who are good social workers or good care professionals. We also need people who are good managers because in this sector we're looking after major um, budgets and we have to have that sort of, that sort of managerial skill in the sector as well. Um, so staff are an important uh, um, way of uh, seeking improvements in service managements, but so are the people who use the services. Um, they might actually have some pretty good ideas about how to um, provide a better um, service to them. Since we are trying to help them, there's perhaps a tendency, uh, even before the crisis when there was a, an ever-increasing um, uh, budget for social services. Those were the, the good times in some countries. And there was perhaps a tendency just to do more of the same, to provide more of the same service, more of a traditional service model. But maybe that's having to change a little bit now because of the crisis, and maybe we need to go to the people using social services more and say, well, what do you actually want? Is this the right sort of service, or can we offer you something a little bit different? And that might result, um, perhaps slightly controversially, in those services that people want actually costing a little bit less or in spending less on some groups who don't need as much help as we thought they did, but spending a little bit more on other groups who need a little bit more help. Um, and the last point, uh, it came up in the questioning earlier. We, the 
family carers and volunteers in Europe are a major um, part of our welfare model and they're probably not well enough valued and supported at the moment um, despite the very high level of care needs that they actually cover. I believe there's an estimate for the pan-European level that family carers cover something like 80% of all the um, care needs in Europe. Maybe a bit long, yeah. um, well, the, I wanted to show you just um, two bits of, uh, of this um, slide. When we're talking about um, innovation, um, we need to be aware that perhaps some of the, in some cases, the innovation might not work out. It's very easy to celebrate and reward success when it happens, but what about accepting occasional failure? We have to learn to deal with, with that as well um, at the uh, managerial and political level. Um, a few points on social investment. Um, since I believe that we're all uh, now more and more interested in economics. We're all becoming amateur economists because we're watching what's happening in the Eurozone. But in social services, we're used to justifying our, um, what we do in terms of uh, the, the values. You know, it's a good thing that we help people who need, uh, in need. But we also have to learn uh, to justify um, our investments, for example, in the area of mental health or in uh, early childhood services in economic terms. And there are some models around that do that. Um, and uh, I'll finish with this slide. You know that uh, in London this summer we had, um, we had the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. And I had the good fortune to go and see a couple of these, uh, a couple of the um, uh, sports being played there, both for the Olympics and then for the Paralympics. And as if it wasn't uh, amazing enough to see the Olympic athletes competing, when you then saw a couple of weeks later the Paralympic athletes, people with so-called disabilities, um, doing some pretty amazing things, it was, it was quite inspiring. And these are people who are fit and dedicated and competitive. And they were out there on the, uh, in the stadiums taking risks they were enjoying life, and they were actually also entertaining people. And to get there, they needed a strong team of supportive people around them. And perhaps there are some lessons in that for, um, for social services too. So I'll pass on now to, um, to Steinar for uh, a local um, case study from Denmark. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I'm uh, a bit uh, a challenged man right now because uh, I have an uh, economic crisis to take care of and uh, on the same time I can see the time frame. <laughs> so I don't know if it's okay if I at least spend 10 minutes. I'll cut down the presentation, but uh, I think I need 10 minutes at least. Yeah, you've got so I hope that's okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Well, uh, I... Um, I thought that I would uh, take you through the whole Danish welfare model, but uh, I'll spare that. Uh, there's uh, just two points from this slide that I would uh, like to uh, address, and that's the two last ones, because they have, uh, some, uh, they have some meaning until what I'm going to say, and that is in Denmark uh, we have a principle of compensation so that uh, disabled are legally entitled to compensation in order to be able to live as the ma majority. And that uh, has a large uh, influence on what means we can uh, do to, uh, to handle, uh, what means we can take to handle the crisis. Uh, on the other hand, there's a decentralized model in Denmark so that the, the municipalities where I work, uh, we can uh, lowly, uh, locally, uh, and that's uh, the politicians who decide, uh, can lowly, locally set the level of service within the law. So we have some good possibilities to, uh, to change the way we deliver social services in the munici municipalities. Uh, first, uh, what uh, initiated the crisis in Denmark? Uh, foremost, there was um, two, three years ago, there was a zero strategy uh, that meant that uh, the, the state decided that the municipalities couldn't spend more money on social welfare. 
Uh, and uh, if we did, we have to pay half of the money spent on social services, extra money spent on social services. We had to pay them back to the government. That was uh, to stop the social expenses rising in Denmark. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, more users who need help. So that's uh, a real important constraint on how we do social services in Denmark. Uh, then I'll uh, go to the fourth point that is uh, there are, uh, I guess it's the same in Spain, there are high expectations of our services uh, from uh, the client, uh, clients uh, and the client organizations uh, and they have a high expectation to us and that means that we uh, have to deliver services of a very uh, uh, good quality. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, you have the same uh, challenge in Spain, but there's a pressure from uh, politicians and the media uh, on the social uh, services and uh, they often find cases where we did uh, wrong and that uh, means that if we, you can see one case that went wrong, uh, everything we do in social services is wrong. So uh, that means that gives uh, a lot of pressure on the service, social services as well. Um, and then we can see there's a rise in clients partly due to uh, increased use of diagnosis. Uh, we are much better now to diagnose the users, but that means that uh, they have an, an expectation of we can help them and uh, give them very specialized help. So that uh, uh, means that we have uh, to take care of that group as well. So um, we can see in Denmark that uh, the expenses are on the rise, the demands are on the rise, uh, but it didn't happen overnight, it's built up uh, during years. And when I describe the crisis in Denmark, I think it's important to say it's not, uh, as I see it, as severe as the crisis in Spain when I look at your uh, unemployment figures. So uh, you probably cannot compa compare the two countries, but I hope what I'm going to say afterwards will give you some uh, inspiration uh, to work with the, the social services. Uh, just shortly about Aarhus, the city where I'm from, uh, we are the second biggest city in Denmark. Uh, you prob I don't know if you know Aarhus, so you probably know Copenhagen, uh, that's the capital. Uh, and uh, we have uh, about 350,000 uh, uh, inhabitants in Aarhus. Uh, we're placed in, uh, in Jotland, as you, can, as you can see on the map, we're in, uh, in the, the central region of Denmark. And uh, in the Department of Social Service, where I'm head, it's, uh, we have a budget about uh, 300,000 euros. Uh, no, 300 million euros, should, it should say. Uh, yeah, <laughs> otherwise I have a lot to attend to when I come home. Uh, and uh, we have uh, about uh, 2,800 uh, employees. Uh, and the clients we serve is uh, disabled adults. We have uh, social psychiatry and socially disadvantaged people. We have homeless and abusers, and we have uh, children at risk. Um, that's the, the main uh, target groups we have in the, in the social services. Uh, now I will uh, show you the, the economic uh, problems I've, that I have been facing during the last three years. Uh, as you can see in this uh, figure, we have uh, uh, the green is uh, our spending and uh, the red one is our budget. That means that we have been uh, overspending uh, quite a while uh, due to the, the problems I uh, showed you before. And uh, at the same time you can see that the budgets are uh, being reduced. So we have cut back the, the spendings for about uh, eight and a half, ten percent during the last two years. And that's been a rather rough uh, period, and I'll go to how, how we did that. Uh, you can see that the number of employees in the department has been uh, falling for, uh, from about 3,100 3, to 2,700 during the, these two years. So it's been a quite drastic uh, fall in the, the number of employees. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, had... Uh, more users that we have to help. We, uh, at the same time activities, we have a rise of 18% of users. And uh, in our living and housing uh, services, we have a rise of 14%. So at the same time as we've been uh, cutting costs, 
we have been uh, transforming the organization so that we can help more people at the same time. Uh, and uh, what, uh, what did we do to do that? Uh, there's uh, a lot of different uh, uh, initiatives to, uh, to, uh, to handle this crisis. Uh, first and foremost, we uh, s uh, said that we had to go back to basics and uh, being good at doing exactly the things that the, the uh, users needed and uh, cutting back on uh, things that might be interesting for us to do but uh, didn't affect the users that much. So what, that was one thing. And then uh, there was an uh, initiative concerning inten intense financial management and that meant uh, frozen consumption in the second half of 2011 uh, meaning that uh, we didn't hire new staff if uh, someone stopped uh, because uh, they were ha retired for pension or if they uh, found a new job, we didn't uh, recruit new per personnel. The personnel had to take care of the tasks uh, uh, anyway. And uh, at the same time, every, any spending over 1,000 euro, I had to approve. And uh, actually, that didn't come that many. I had to approve because uh, people knew that they shouldn't spend uh, more than 1,000 uh, euros uh, on buying things. Uh, I didn't have to uh, uh, approve all the p p wage payments and so, I meant just buying new things. Uh, and uh, it was uh, very important for us to say that, uh, to establish a culture where we said that uh, uh, the budgets had to be hold uh, whatever. And that uh, meant that I, uh, during the last uh, two years, have been. Uh, uh, forced to remove three of my uh, leaders or uh, managers in the organization because they didn't perform uh, compared to the budget. So it has been really intense financial management. And we have also uh, been spending some time in being better to control our economy, economy building up management control system in uh, relation to, uh, to how we spend the money and what we spend them on. Uh, we have uh, worked on common professional grounds focusing on the effect of social services. I'll come back to that. And uh, the main focus have, have been in uh, empowerment of the clients and the way we do our, um, in d deliver our services. Uh, we have uh, worked intensely in uh, the administration on uh, ensuring our political legi legitimacy of uh, what we are doing. Uh, so that the, the politicians in the city council uh, backed us up in uh, doing these things because it's hard and there's a lot of complaints from the citizens when we uh, cut back the service levels and, we, uh, and when we uh, uh, have to uh, say no to uh, users who normally uh, are entitled to help. Uh, and then we have uh, redesigned a lot of our, our uh, services uh, on uh, the way to say you, we would like to give better services even though we have uh, less money to do it. And uh, I think this is uh, uh, Cameron uh, uh, line more for less, but uh, anyway we had to lower our standard prices and at the same time give uh, services to more people and give services that we think are better. And uh, if you see the standard prices that's on the slide, we have reduced our standard prices in uh, family care, uh, 6% supported service for mentally ill. Uh, in own homes, we redu reduced uh, the cost 20% and uh, disabled uh, support in uh, services uh, in their homes, we reduced them 9%. And now I'll turn to what uh, we did. I've uh, taken uh, four cases. Uh, the first one, uh, if you start on uh, the left, at, that uh, is uh, a clear reduction in the service level. Uh, we said here that uh, if we uh, have an intake of 13% uh, extra disabled people who need uh, uh, help in their homes, uh, we have to do, and we have to do it within the same budget, we have to reduce the number of hours help we give uh, the users. So that a clearly uh, cut in the service level, fewer hours, hours for the users. Um, then we have, uh, in our children's uh, department, we have uh, worked on uh, that we would like to use foster 
uh, and family care more instead of uh, institutions, both because uh, it's both because it's uh, we think it's a better way to deliver social services, but it's a, a cheaper way. A family care, a foster family costs half as much as an institution, uh, one place in an institution. And uh, that means that we have uh, changed our spendings so that you can see on the right-hand side that uh, we now uh, spend more in foster care, uh, less in institutions, and uh, that uh, gives us uh, 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 economic win uh, at the same time that we can deliver services uh, for, uh, for the children who need uh, placement. Uh, you can't see it on the slide, but at the same time we reduced uh, the number of children placed outside their homes uh, with, uh, uh, I think, uh, 15%. And you can always discuss if, uh, if they need a placement outside the home, but we think that uh, we can give them other uh, uh, services uh, that take uh, uh, their, uh, in, in their neighborhood instead of uh, removing them from, from their homes. In our uh, uh, department of mentally uh, ill adults, we have worked for, uh, with a recovery process. We have uh, our recovery strategy that's based on the empowerment. Uh, we take the outset in uh, the users' uh, dreams and needs and ask them uh, what kind of services they would like in their single case. And uh, they, uh, many of them, actually do not want to live in an institution. They want to live like uh, the rest of us. So uh, we have uh, worked uh, for several years very uh, uh, orientated against, uh, uh, towards uh, that we uh, would like to uh, reduce the number of mentally ill in institutions, uh, in residential homes, uh, and instead give them uh, uh, support where they live in their own homes, in their own apartments, uh, and um, give them uh, help during the daytime. And as you can see, uh, our spendings in Aarhus, so this, uh, here I've compared it to Copenhagen. Copenhagen is twice as big at all, as Aarhus. But if you see the spendings, we have uh, very, very uh, little spending on uh, residential homes, but we spend the money on uh, in-house support and day activities instead. And uh, our, uh, uh, when we uh, measure the user satisfaction, uh, we have a uh, very, very good user satisfa satisfaction also compared to Copenhagen. So that's quite interesting that we uh, make another, uh, ty give other types of services, but uh, the results are, are the same. And it's much cheaper. Uh, the last uh, case I've brought is that we, um, Denmark is a very institutionalized society. Every ch child goes to a daycare institution. Uh, everything is taken care of the public. Someone will say that, I think, especially if you, if you look at Denmark from the outside. And uh, we have uh, said that we have to uh, go back to a more uh, uh, cooperation with uh, the civic, civic society and uh, using the nearest uh, relations uh, of the clients in the way we produce uh, social services. And uh, what we did is to say, instead of uh, saying that we have to make uh, our children play football in their own clubs, we bring them to the clubs, the football clubs in the city. Uh, we, uh, instead of having uh, daycare, day center activities for disabled people, we try to give them uh, more ordinary employment. Uh, often we have to create new jobs, it has to be easy jobs, but uh, it's jobs in shops, in the uh, kitchen where they uh, help uh, cooking, uh, preparing food, it's uh, in the parks, in uh, maintaining parks and streets, and um, they are very, very glad to do something else and being in our uh, daycare uh, activities, or day center activities. You, it, children in need, instead of uh, placing them in a separate institutions or school. We uh, have a target that says uh, we would like to uh, give them uh, the opportunity to stay in the ordinary school in the local environment and give them help there instead. That's a cheaper way of doing it. I think actually for the children it's a better solution. Uh, and then we uh, work on having more volunteers in uh, our organization helping uh, the users 
uh, and that could be relatives, that could be others, and they are very good at uh, helping us uh, when we need trips, if there are going to be some activities outside the normal uh, working hours. So that's some of the ways we've been uh, working uh, with the cutting uh, costs. So we both cut uh, the, the service levels, but we also have uh, been working on finding new ways of solving uh, the, uh, the, the tasks we have in social services. Uh, so the question was, uh, and I can see the time's running, uh, I'm so engaged in what we do. So. Uh, I think I'll skip this one and go to the... Um, yeah, uh, I'll turn to the two last dots here. Uh, we have uh, tightened up and uh, cut the costs, but uh, if we look at the, the, our user satisfaction uh, measuring, we can see that there's a marginal effect uh, on, uh, on... If you see how much we've cut the costs, and uh, at the same time, it's almost the same user satisfaction. Our uh, employees are less sick now than they were three years ago. And uh, that, if you compare that to the working environment, that's actually a very important indicator. And so that uh, things are going well, even though uh, we have been uh, through uh, rough times. Um, and uh, as I see it, there are a few areas now in the organization where we cannot uh, cut any deeper. Uh, so we try to find the, the cost reductions other, way, other, way, uh, other places now. Uh, I think it's been important in the, the process that uh, there has been an inclusion of uh, employees and leaders uh, on the ways uh, in both explaining what we are doing so that they have an uh, insight in what's happening in the organization uh, and uh, of course, we have uh, had a, a lot of communication, both with uh, and cooperation with both the users and our employees. Uh, I can say that the employees have been very uh, unsatisfied with uh, the budget constraints, and that's uh, of course made things uh, difficult. But we have tried to be as open and communicating as possible on why we are doing it, that the budgets have to have to be met, and uh, asking for ideas to how we can do it in a good way when we have to do it anyway. And then uh, the last one, uh, prospects for the future. Uh, first and foremost, we cannot expect higher budgets. Some of my employees, uh, even though even some of my leaders say uh, problems will solve next year because the budgets will rise, I don't think so. Uh, we just made new cuts for the budgets for two 2013. So I ha uh, think we have to do uh, find other solutions than waiting for the budgets to rise. And uh, what we uh, must stay focused on is the tight financial management. We have to uh, keep on innovating and uh, rethinking the social services uh, with an um, uh, empowerment uh, st strategy and involving the users in how we plan the, the welfare uh, services and uh, yeah and uh, also on the ways measure what the results what outcomes comes from the services that we deliver so that we spend our money on the services that gives the best results for the users yes that's it <laughs>